uh, yes, it is. Let me welcome our online community. Thank you. I think uh, we're just now getting connected to our online community. Thank you for sharing testimonies here. It's awesome to be here. Um, my name is Corey. I'm one of the pastors here at Living Roots. I'll welcome our online community uh, and get everyone kind of going here. Um, hopefully, we'll have good audio today. So if we don't, just um, yell at the audio guy, which, you know, is me. So there we go. Um, no, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, good to be part of Living Roots. It's exciting to be here. It is the first Sunday of the month. And so every first Sunday of the month, we try to give updates on our burnt building, which is next door in downtown Santa Rosa. We're gonna, we're, we hope to transform it into a children's ministry and a parsonage, which is a place where our lead pastor and his family can live. Where are you guys living now? Living on campus with us. And so uh, s secretly, the longer we take on this, the better. No, just, just, just kidding. No, it is exciting. We, we've, uh, we've already raised like $89,000 to help fix that thing. It's a $600,000, $800,000 project, and uh, it's just been an awesome start. And so we're going to do it in phases, uh, but that's the update for now. Thank you for those of you that have given towards the project. We hope to actually see it used when we can actually use a children's ministry, right? Someday, we hope that we can actually use a children's ministry uh, and, and use that for, for better. And so that's exciting. Uh, so many things going on at Living Roots. There's a whole lot coming up. Today's our last day of a series that we've been a part of it, uh, called Aftershock. It's been a financial series called Aftershock, Surviving an Economic Earthquake. Uh, and hopefully that's been helpful for you. Today's our last week for that. Um, next week, we're going to start going into our Christmas series uh, called Outlast, Things That Last Forever. Uh, and we're going to do that right through Christmas, and I'm really excited about that and learning what uh, what the Bible teaches on that kind of stuff. Um, other than that, there's a ton uh, coming up. There's a Christmas Eve gathering that we're going to do downtown Santa Rosa, outside downtown uh, in the Courthouse Square. We hope to just do some caroling outside, spaced apart, as safe as we can. Uh, downtown, just to bless the downtown community on Christmas Eve. If you are available, feel free to come join us at 6 p.m. in Courthouse Square, and we'll we'll do that. That'll be exciting. Um, trying to think what else. Uh, prayer, prayer and fasting. That's wonderful. Yeah, so we've invited our community. Uh, about once a month, we've been doing this prayer and fasting um, rhythm because we want to always be praying and want to you know, regularly be fasting. And the whole point of that is to connect more with God. And so uh, obviously God's near, God's in present all the time. Uh, but when we like neglect ourselves of some type of thing that we turn to for satisfaction, it's like we replace that with God instead, and so we encourage you, if you feel led to do that, to, to join us tomorrow, actually. Uh, as a community, we're going to be praying and, and fasting for the day, uh, and just uh, what I call fasting, I call it feasting on Jesus is what I call that, and so when you are hungry or whatever you fast from tomorrow, uh, may you be reminded that Jesus actually is the one who fully satisfies, and so I encourage you to join us in that if you would like. Uh, that would be awesome. So that's tomorrow. Um, Thank you for those of you that give towards Living Roots. Uh, Living Roots exists to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus. And so it's been exciting to be a part of something that does that, to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus, no matter where you are in your relationship with Jesus. Whether you've first time hearing about Jesus or you've been scarred by Jesus followers or you've been following Jesus for 40 years in your life, we can always be growing in our relationship with Jesus. And what actually grows in our relationship is our trust. And so that's why we exist. Everything we do is to help people grow in their trust in Jesus. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of that. Um, if you feel led to give towards Living Roots, thank you for doing that. Thank you for those who do faithfully give towards Living Roots to helping people grow in their relationship with Jesus. Uh, you can actually do that online on our website, or you can also text 84321. Uh, you can text to give or however you feel led to do that. But uh, thank you. Just want to thank everyone for trusting God in that area uh, and and just kind of growing in our relationship with Jesus, especially in that area. That's hard, especially now, Christmas time and, and uh, presents and all that kind of stuff. It's hard to prioritize, hard to trust Jesus when you may not know exactly where your income is going to come from. And so uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, and it's awesome to grow in our relationship with Jesus that way uh, and also many other ways. And so, Art, I would like to pray for you if that's all right. No, it's not okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, Pray for you. I thank you for uh, being willing to share the word today. And I'm excited. And may we all grow in our relationship with Jesus today through what you share. Amen. Um, and may God speak through you. So, God, I pray that you uh, continue to work through art. I know you've been working through him in the weeks uh, leading up to this. I thank you that um, 
your, you, your word is like a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Mm-hmm. I thank you that you uh, care about our hearts, mm-hmm. that you actually want a relationship with mm-hmm. us. Uh, and may we grow in our relationship with you, God. That's amazing. And mm-hmm. so uh, speak through us, speak to us today through Art, and may Art have peace as he shares. May you just flow through him. May we all receive whatever you would have to share today. May we be encouraged and may we grow in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, th- th- can I have a hug? Oh, thanks. <laughs> we live on the same campus, so we could hug. <clears throat> it's good that way. Awesome. Uh, great to be with you guys here. Uh, great to be with you online as well. Welcome. I um, hope you guys are blessed. I hope you're, you're experiencing God and his presence on a regular basis because He's always around, and he's real, and it's a blessing to walk with him. I um, want to sh- uh, paint a picture for you guys. So it, here, here's a picture for you. Imagine you're ready to buy some land. You want to buy some land because you want to put a home on it. You're ready. You've been saving. You don't believe in borrowing money. You don't believe in you know, borrowing from family, friends, or the bank or anything. You saved a chunk of change and you are being showed property after property, land after land, uh, from a realtor, and he says, hey, this just popped on the market, and he takes you to this land, and it's 200 plus acres, and uh, from the the street side, uh, he says, hey, look at, there's the flat spaces where you can build your home, and you're looking, and uh, it's like fantastic. He says, why don't you walk on this property. Why don't you guys m- meander around? I'm going to leave. You call me later or email me and let me know if you want to move forward with this property. So picture yourself wandering on this property and you stand where the open space is where you're going to build, right? And you picture it. This is where the log house is going to be, right here. The wraparound porch. Can you picture it yet? Or whatever house you would like to see there. You know, you got your basketball court, you got your swimming pool, four-car garage. That's the kind of house I would want, a four-car garage. That means more tools for me. Anyways, so you're picturing this, right? You're like, yes, I'd like to buy this land, right? But it's out of your price range. And you say, you know what, I'm going to keep walking to see what's on this acreage. So you start hiking. You start hiking. The realtor left. He said, go ahead, meander around and so you're hiking, you look over this ridge, and you're like, wow, this is beautiful. I could see all of Santa Rosa. You hike over this ridge, and you see more, you know, different towns. You're like, this is wonderful. And then you hike over this ridge, and you look to the right, and you're like, this is so beautiful. Trees after trees. And then you look to the left, and you're like, what's that? It's this beautiful log cabin with a wraparound porch, four-car garage. Instead of a pool, there's a lake right there. And so you kind of hike down the hill and you go to the house and it's empty. Doors unlocked. You walk in. You're like, this is unbelievable. You look on the map and it's like, this is right in the middle of the property. The, the realtor said there's no home on the property. They don't have a clue that this is sitting here. And you're like, this is, this is like a gem in the middle of this property. And you're like, okay, you shut the door and you're like, this is like too good to be true. You walk off the property And you uh, go to connect with the realtor, and he tells you how much it is. And you ask him, hey, is there a house? And he says, I don't think so. We just got it. I think it's going to go pretty quick. And um, so my question is, if this was a real-life scenario for you, would you sell everything you had to buy this land for that, that house, that treasure that's sitting on the land? Would you do that? Yeah? Yeah? Would you? probably. I, I know I would. I'd be like, hey, I'm getting rid of my bitcoins. I'm going to trade all my cryptocurrency. I'm going to buy this land with that treasure that nobody knows about on that property. Well, there's actually a parable, a short story that Jesus shares just like that. He says, the kingdom of God, so a, a kingdom, there's a kingdom, there's a king who reigns in this kingdom, and it's God in this case. The kingdom of God is like a man who is on this land and he finds this treasure buried. 
And he's so blown away at this treasure. He wants this treasure. And so he reburies it. He sells everything he has, and he buys that land. So Jesus shares that. So it's a lot like this story, right? And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about and diving into today. Jesus told the followers, the hearers of this parable, that he said, seek first this kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. So we're going to dive into that. You know, there's benefits to seeking first the kingdom of God. And there's many benefits, actually, to, care, uh, to seek first the kingdom of God. One, the main benefit is that you receive God. He's the greatest gift of all gifts. He's the greatest treasure of all treasures. That we would seek first the kingdom of God and receive God himself. We have been, like Corey mentioned, going through a series of talks called Aftershock, surviving an economic earthquake, sur surviving this financial crisis, this pandemic season, right? I don't know the last time I've been in a pandemic, you know, I'm 40 plus years old and I forgot the real number. Nope, I'm 41 and uh, I've not really experienced life anything like this. It's a, a unique time. There's many people who might be experiencing financial crisis and many that are not uh, yet. And so there's a lot up in the air, whether it's political. I mean, we're in a season that is uh, uncertain. And so I was thinking through, uh, you know, la last week, Corey, or two weeks ago, Corey started the series and he spoke on contentment. This idea of placing our, our hope and faith in Jesus, finding contentment in Jesus and not in our circumstances. And oftentimes when we look to our circumstances, whether it's a faithful job that we've had or finances or a stock market, when those circumstances change, all of a sudden life is like uncertain, as opposed to having faith in Jesus and that circumstance doesn't change. Jesus doesn't change. And so the second week, last week, Corey spoke on this idea of stewardship and ownership. What is our mentality with stuff? What is our mentality on finances? Are we owners of it? I know many people in conversation, I've done this. I've created this wealth. I've accrued all of this. It's me. It's my charisma. It's my this. It's my skill. It's my study. It's whatever. I've done this, but all of it could be gone like that. Because ultimately, it's not us. It's God's grace that we've experienced what we've experienced, or we have what we have, or we know and have a mind to think the way we think. It's all because of God and His grace. And so Corey spoke into, do we live like owners, or do we live like stewards? It's all of God's, and He entrusts certain things to certain people. And those who are good stewards will receive more, as the Scripture says. And so this week, I want to dive into the speaking on this idea of where is our priorities? You know, depending on where our priority is, uh, depends on where our faith is, where our devotion to God is. And so I was thinking through, and this is connected to a connect I had with Amber this week, because in the midst of this pandemic we're in, right, there's a lot going on. And, and oftentimes, those external situations dictate my faith. They change faith. They, they shake up things for people. I was uh, shopping two days ago at Costco. My wife says, hey, we have two rolls of toilet paper left. We have two rolls left. You need to go get some toilet paper. And I'm like, okay, we got, we're down to two. We need to, you know, go, go take care of that business. So I go to Costco, and I'm walking in there. I don't even grab a cart because I know I'm just going to get, you know, a, a, what would you call that, a bundle, a ream? <laughs> a bucket of toilet paper, right? So I got this bucket. I throw it over my shoulder. I'm walking out, and I see two ladies in their 50s and 60s with a shopping cart just like this, you know, pushing it. And they look at me, and they say, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. And they point to my toilet paper, so I hold it tighter. No. <laughs> no. And I, no, I, I literally think, because I literally was thinking, wait a minute. Why is this happening? Because when I first grabbed the toilet paper, all the hand towels were gone. All the like paper towels were gone for your hands. And the toilet paper, you're down to uh, a, a, 
a pallet and a half. And when cost goes down to a pallet and a half, normally they have like eight pallets of three different kinds of toilet papers. When they're down to a pallet and a half, you know something's happening. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't watch news. And so I don't know what's going on with news, but something is happening on the news that's stirring people to worry. And this individual, probably many people, are starting to freak out. But I went in because I needed toilet paper and I had peace. I, I wasn't the one looking like my wife had two rolls left saying, hey, we need some toilet paper. But I was thinking I felt so bad for the lady who was like in a rush because I need toilet paper. Sharing this with Amber last week, we were like, we were like talking about what did the church do? What did literally the church do during pandemics and crisis like this? What was the church like during World War I and the deep depression before that? What was the church like in the scriptures? Does the scripture share at all anywhere that the church went through a pandemic, you know, a famine? And it does over and over. You open to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, you see the church in Antioch. They were being persecuted. So on top of pandemic, on top of famine, they were being killed because of their belief. And then they go through this famine situation that was actually prophesied by a believer. And so they're going through this famine. What did they do? What did the church in Antioch do? They gathered together. They poured in a pile of what they had, and they gave it away. Wait a minute. That's not typically our response when we're watching the news. When we're, when we're in the midst of uncertainty, we typically don't give things away. So Amber had the great idea last week. We should, as the church, we should buy toilet paper and go downtown and give it away. We should just give roll after roll away as good news people. Because believers are good news people, right? We have good news. Look, you can have toilet paper for free. So I think that's a great idea to live like the church in Acts and hand out toilet paper. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of leaves. You just grow trees. Yeah, yeah Am Amber said, we'll just have to figure out as the church to what are we going to use for toilet paper? God will provide. God will provide for sure. So thank you, Jesus. I read this article last week connected uh, to uh, financial crisis, and this writer was trying to give insight because Corey was, he shared a couple weeks ago, you know, most of the advice and talk about finances is through the church, and there's a reason for that, and it's not necessarily directly tied to because the church needs donations to run, you know. I believe it's connected more to how we are enslaved to finances, and God wants to set us free from even that, but this writer on this article, he writes and he says, uh, these are three sure ways to survive a financial crisis. And he gave some great insight. And you notice, Corey preached twice. I'm preaching this weekend. None of, none of it was, we need to save more. This is how to do it. We need to invest like this. We need to put together a budget. All of these, those things are helpful. They're all helpful. And if you guys want help with that online, if you guys want help with that, email Corey at Corey at livingrootsca.org. He'd love to help you with that. No, honestly, though, we would. If we get enough emails, we will do a seminar here with a whiteboard and we'll help people with practical financial tips because we've preached on it before we'll do it again but this series is not just about that because this article we could live out those three things and still not be content we could live out those three things and still live like owners not stewards we can still live like our priorities are all wrong and if our priorities are wrong then life is a mess and so I want to speak into that today. Every year we try to preach on finances. Every year Living Roots is faithfully trying to share on finances, not because we, we need, but because uh, finances tend to be, the, there's two things. Finances tend to be the things that enslave us. It just grips us slowly. It grips us. Things, possessions grip us. If they didn't, if we weren't enslaved to those two things, it wouldn't feel so good to get more of it 
or feels so good to get rid of it. Have you ever cleaned out clutter in your home and you're like, wow, I feel like a weight off me. It's because we're enslaved to it. And so these things are real things. And so as we teach on it regularly, annually, we do it on purpose because we care. If I didn't care, like I would have a hard time sitting in a room saying, uh, can I have your money? That's just weird, right? But I have so much more peace with sharing about finances and giving and tithing because it's not about receiving. It's about giving. There's so much freedom in that. If we read the scriptures, we can see the freedom that comes with releasing. And so we faithfully try to do that. Now I'm aware that there are many different uh, backgrounds and people in the room here today and online. We could have people that are watching or here present that uh, don't fully have faith in Jesus. That we're not following God right now. Um, he's not the king of our kingdom. We're the king of our kingdom. Uh, that might be you today. That might be you online. Uh, and so hearing uh, what I'm about to share today may not make much sense. I hope to make it clear uh, for us. You might be here today because, you know, I, I learned something this week that uh, there are people who don't believe in Jesus and they still tithe to the church. Did you know that? There are still people who give, though they, they wouldn't call themselves Christians. Um, that's a common thing. I didn't know that. But uh, I've learned that. So that was news flash to me. There's, there could be an individual here today or uh, watching online where you're a new believer and you don't really know what tithing is all about or what scripture fully says about it. I hope today is helpful in that. Um, you might be giving regularly a portion of your income, like purposefully, not just like change in a bucket, but purposefully, hey, I'm going to purposefully give $100 a month or $200 a month or 5% of my income, and that's, that's great. I hope that uh, you can learn something today. Uh, you might be here today and you give a tithe without even thinking about it. I hope you can learn something today. Uh, you might be here today and you give a full tithe and you give an offering on top of that. I pray that you as well learn something today. And so I know I was completely blessed as I was studying and God was ministering to my heart in and with this topic. And so I'm excited uh, to share uh, with you guys about provision, or not provision, but uh, priorities, rather. Now, I've been sharing on this topic for many years. I've talked about it. I've discipled many people in, in many areas as, you know, with tied to finances as well, and I've, I've, heard, I've heard it all. I've heard a ton. I've heard, when I get more money, I will give. When I become richer, I will give more. Now, that's like mixing two different concepts. Because rich people are rich and generous people are generous. It's not, it's not directly tied. And then the truth is, actually the opposite is true. The truth is, the scriptures say, if uh, it's, it's harder for those who have a lot to give. And, and there's a, a, some reference about a camel and an eye of a needle. So what is, what is the reference? How's that go? Anybody remember a camel? Exactly. Okay, so it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to, to enter the kingdom of God. That same concept, right? Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate that. That's good. Now, uh, Jesus shares this tied to finances. He says, uh, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now, I wish, I wish being devoted to God had nothing to do with finances. I wish that was the case, but it clearly isn't the case. It's clearly wherever our treasure is, wherever our resources are invested, wherever we spend our time for and with money, uh, that's where our heart is. And that's the truth. You know, it doesn't say where your heart is, your finances will follow. It says where your money is, your finances, or where your treasure is, your heart follows. It's the opposite. 
It's not where, where, because you can say, I love God, I'm following God, my priorities are this, but your money is so somewhere else. That's ultimately where your heart is. That's where you think about, you know. And so Jesus gives a warning here as he shares this statement, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And because that's the case, we will teach about the, 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 the sticky places of finances and how it'll, it'll just grab our hearts and it drags us down from truly being free. So until God is priority in our finances, he won't be priority with our time and our hearts. When he's priority with our finances, he will have our hearts fully. And, and I believe that. I've seen it in my life. I've seen my finances spent this way. My finances spent in cars and all these different things. My kingdom was me and my stuff. I've seen it. And I was in bondage. I remember saying just a, a few months ago, there was an individual in their 20s, and they were doing this, this, and this with their car. And I was like, I was you. I had a car, and I dropped it, right? If you know what that means, you make your car lower. And I put bigger rims on it, and they were shiny. And I put big speakers in the back because I wanted to lose my hearing. And that wasn't the truth. I wanted to be noticed, or I wanted to sound cool. I wanted to look cool. And I drove that car because that's where my value was. That's where my identity was tied. And I did that. And then I went the opposite way because I was tired of going sideways over railroad tracks trying to not hit the bottom of my car. I went with a big truck with big tires, and all of it was an identity issue. And I've been enslaved, so I know what it feels like. And I want freedom for my church family. And so Jesus teaches us this awesome principle about our treasure and our hearts and where they'll be. Now, <clears throat> I want to give us, uh, I want to give us a, a charge or a call right now. Whether you're into following what I read in the scriptures, uh, and you want to follow it in your Bibles, I encourage you to do that if you want. I'll be in Luke uh, uh, chapter 12. Or if you want to follow on the screen, you can do that as well. Or you can shut your eyes. And this is where I want to encourage you guys. If you want to shut your eyes and picture yourself at the feet of Jesus, listening in the first century to Jesus say these words. You are literally in the presence of God at the foot of Jesus as he's talking. I want you to envision this, okay? Place ourselves in this moment. Now, I want to set the stage before I start reading the scriptures. Here's the first verse, but I want to set the stage. Jesus, and there's many people around him, and he's teaching these wonderful things. And then two guys come and interrupt Jesus. I'll back up for a second. Two guys come and interrupt Jesus. One of them says, Hey, teacher, tell my brother to split the inheritance. Tell him to split our inheritance. So they just had parents die. They had got this wonderful inheritance. And he's feeling like it's unjust. And he's telling Jesus, tell him to give me more right? So Jesus just shares this, this, this parable, this story about this rich fool and how he spent his money, how he tried to acquire money. He finishes teaching on that, and then he shares this. These several verses that I would like for you to journey with me as if you're listening to Jesus as he's teaching this. If you're following along, I'm using the NLT translation the New Living Translation. It says this. So, Jesus, so then, turning to his disciples, Jesus said, that is why I tell you. So we just got done sharing a parable about a rich fool. That is why I tell you, verse 22, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothing to wear. For life is more than food and your body more than clothing. Look at the ravens. 
Don't they plant or harvest? They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if, you're, and if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon, in all his glory, was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. But your father, he already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal. No thief can steal it. And no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So Jesus shares this. There's so much we can pull out of this. This, this could be used to teach about not worrying about anything. This could be used to, to teach about how God provides. This could be used to, to be taught on having faith in God. But I believe it's speaking towards priorities. I believe verse 31 stands out to me. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. Everything. The other day, my, my son, one of my boys, I have two of them, one of my boys says, um, it's not a want, Dad, it's a need. <laughs> when he was talking about video games and Legos, he's like, it's not a want, it's a need. I said, You've been around the scriptures, and you know God will provide for needs, but not wants, right? <laughs> now, as I read this, seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. What in the world does kingdom of God mean? What does it mean? When you hear kingdom of God, what do you guys think about? And if you're online, please start typing. This is what I think about when I hear kingdom of God. What do you guys think about? Okay. Okay. What is God up to? Not what the world's up to. Not what I'm up to. What is God up to? So that's good. Uh, what is the kingdom of God? Okay, what God wants for you is it, okay. Why we exist? We don't just exist for ourselves. Okay, good. What is the kingdom of God? <clears throat> in, the world. 
It's the rule and reign of God. Awesome. Any other words to explain what the kingdom of God is? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay, the kingdom of God, there's righteousness, there's peace, there's joy. The kingdom of God is where God reigns, where the life is lived not for us, but a life submitted to God, where he has authority. It's watching, knowing, understanding what the Father is doing and doing it. Mm -hmm. This is good. More? I'm worshiping right now. This is worshipful. Amen. Please feel free to uh, chime in at any point uh, for sure. So the scripture also uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, and they're interchangeable kingdom of heaven now uh, in luke chapter 9 verses 1 2 and 6 really tease out what the kingdom of god is and i think it's so beautiful and so in in luke chapter 9 verse 1 it says this one day uh, jesus called together his 12 disciples so if you're still picturing yourself picture yourself as one of the 12 You come together. Jesus says, here, come here, you guys. Come here, gals. I want to talk to you guys. Let me tell you something. So one day, Jesus called together his 12 disciples, and he gave them power and authority to cast out demons and to heal all diseases. Should we just move on? No, that's a big deal, right? That's a big deal. So you're one of the 12 disciples. You come together. Jesus, you've seen Jesus cast out demons. You've seen him heal the sick. And now he says, come here. I'm going to give you power and authority to do the same i'm going to give you power and authority to cast out all demons does it say all yep it says all demons and to heal all diseases so that's pretty cool so if you're sitting here you're probably you have a couple thoughts maybe um are you kidding me are you serious you're you're really going to do that how awesome is that there's no way or you're thinking there I can't do that. Yeah, that's great, Jesus, but there, I, me? You, yes, but me? Really? Verse 2. Then he, Jesus, sent them out, the 12, you guys, okay, two by two, he sends them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God. There's that phrase again. To tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So he, he first says, I'm going to give you power to do this. And then he says, now go out and tell people about the kingdom of God. Go out and tell them and then show them. Right? Heal the sick in the kingdom of God. If you think about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is there sickness in heaven? No. Is there worry? No. No. He's fully provided for. Everything is fully present in heaven that's perfect and right good right and perfect and so when jesus says go tell people about this kingdom where i reign where i'm the head and i want you to show them what the kingdom looks like cast out the demons get rid of all the diseases be good news to others so verse six says so they began their circuit of the villages so they started preaching the good news and healing the sick kingdom of god could be interchanged with kingdom of heaven and they're going to preach it didn't say the kingdom of god they're preaching good news which literally means the gospel They're going to share the gospel, the good news, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So what is the kingdom of heaven? It's the gospel. What is the kingdom of God? It's about the person of Jesus. It's about his work, all that he accomplished on our behalf, because it's good news for all. You could be sitting here today, not a believer. You could be listening online at your office, wherever you're at, not a believer in Jesus. That doesn't matter. There is a kingdom where Jesus reigns and it's good, right, and perfect and that's good news for all. Whether you believe it or not, it's good news for all. 
And so they send, Jesus sends out his disciples and they're sharing about this good news. Well, what is the good news? Every brokenness that you have, everything you experience that's just not right, when you turn off the TV and you shake your head, I can't believe it, all those statements follow those things, when trees die of diseases, when animals have cancer, when people die when they shouldn't, all of that is brokenness. In a world where sin infiltrates everything, our own relationship with ourselves, our minds, our relationships with one another, and our relationship with God. The good news is, God's not done. He sent his son, Jesus, and he's solving all of it. He's reversing all of it back the way God originally intended it to be, in perfect relationship with God. This last week, I'm reading this scripture with my son, Arthur, and we got to the point in the very beginning of the Bible where it's this man named Enoch is introduced. It says he walked in close relationship with God, close fellowship with God, and God took him, and he vanished. He disappeared. My son's like, what? How does that work? I was like, stay tuned, there's more. <laughs> That's good news. So you go and you share about this Jesus. We share about the good news of the person of Jesus who is the king of this kingdom. And he reigns and he has authority. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, God has put all things under the authority of Christ, under the authority of Jesus, and has made him the head over all things for the benefit of the church, for the benefit of those who believe. Not the church as like the, the church, like the Roman Catholic church, not the church like the different congregations, but the church, you, people who proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior. For the benefit of them, God reigns. And when God reigns, it's good news for people. When God is reigning in my life and I'm submitting to him, my life is better. Not the circumstances necessarily, but my life is better. When he's not reigning, I'm not living as healthy and full life. So what does all this have to do with money? What does all this have to do with finances? What does all this have to do with giving and tithing anyways? Well, if following Jesus is in a kingdom where he's the king, he's the Messiah king, he's the anointed, which is what Messiah means, king, and what he says goes, and living in what he says is a good thing for all, we elevate the poor. We bless the widow. All those things is a part of following the work of Christ. If we're living in that kingdom, then all things of our life should be submitted to Jesus. And that's what discipleship, discipleship encompasses all of that. When I was discipled in the faith, that was a part of my pocketbook. How does a believer live with their finances how does a believer live in a relationship with the opposite sex when I'm married now? How does a believer who's submitted to Jesus live in this environment? How do I dress? What do I look at? All those things is submitted to Jesus. And so finances, if we're living in the kingdom of God, and finances is a, an enslavery towards us, it clings to our heart, suffocates us, then it's a part of this kingdom where Jesus reigns. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best thing you, with everything you produce. And this is where tithing comes in. This is where giving comes in. This is how it's connected. Like I said, I wish following and having a devoted relationship with God had nothing to do with resources, had nothing to do with finances. But Jesus says they're tied. He says they're intertwingled. Intertwingled? Intertwingled. <laughs> That's a cool new word, intertwingled. That's fun. Twingled. <laughs> awesome. That's good. Well, the word tithe literally means, so if you don't know, the word tithe literally means a tenth in the Hebrew. It comes from the Hebrew, it comes from the Old Testament, and it literally means a tenth of what God gives. 
And so what does it look like for me to give a tenth of my resources to God? Right? And so uh, the, the tithe means a tenth. That's what the scripture says, yeah. And it says, give a tenth, and it says, oh, watch what I do. Malachi says, God says in Malachi, watch what I do, test me, give your tenth, and watch me provide. Not only will he provide, but oftentimes in my life it's come in abundance. Like, where in the world did this come from? Like, I've, I've given, like, Corey, I'm just going to use you an example. There's this, I share this story. Corey, you're good examples here. I, sh- I, uh, I shared this just the other day in my GCM, one of, one of my GCMs. Corey was hanging out with a guy at the Coast Guard, right? And he asked you for a thousand bucks, right? And it was kind of like, oh, that's awesome. You had the nerve to ask me for a thousand bucks. How cool is that, right? And then you said, if, you know, if, I, if God gives me a thousand bucks, I'll give it to you, right? Correct me when I, if I could go astray from the truth. I want to speak truth. Don't twingle it. I won't twingle it. And <laughs> it is a word. You looked it up? Twist or wrinkle. Twingle. <laughs> Come on now. Come on. That's good. So Corey, what, 24 hours, 48 hours? How quick did God give you $1,000? 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes, God gave Corey $1,000 that he didn't have before. So what did Corey do? He went gambled. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> he gave this guy 1000 bucks, right? Now, I guarantee you, if Corey was to look back at his life, has God provided a hundredfold that thousand dollars? Like, God blesses. God blesses. When we give that tithe, he blesses. And, 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 and so the word in Hebrew means, you know, tithe. It means tenth. And the Bible tells us that tithing is a way to show God that we trust him. Because it says to give of our first fruits. It's not like at the end of the month, okay, I, I, I took care of all I needed, and now I'm going to give what I have left. Or now I'm going to give... Uh, well, a tithe's not left, so that didn't work out. It's more, hey, I just received this money, and I'm going to give a tenth. That's a bigger number than I've ever really given. Uh, like, for example, just some mathematics. I did this math beforehand, so it's not like I know it right now. But if, if you receive $4,000 a month, a tithe would be 400 bucks, right? If you receive $6,000 a month, a tithe is 600 bucks, and so on and so forth. If you get 11000 that's $1,100 we give to God through the local church, and that's what a tithe is. And we do that not because God needs it, not because the local church needs it, though it's structured to be blessed that way. It's because we need it. And that's what's so odd about this. Giving in that way, not controlled, because when we come to the conclusion like, yeah, okay, I'll give, but I want to make sure I know how it's spent. So it's a little better. I'm able to give, but still with control, and that's unhealthy. A full release, I want to give to God to demonstrate I trust him, and I want to bless, and God will bless. And so that's, that's connected to a, a tithe and what, you know, the Bible says. It's showing God that we trust you first. And so uh, oftentimes it's giving right off the top. We get, my wife and I, we get paid in the beginning of the month and in the middle of the month. Right away, we have it automatically coming out. I don't even see it. So if you're at that point, that may be good. That may not be good. It may be like, are you trusting God? And you might have circumstances and situations that arise, and you're like, okay, and you have no trust. So maybe every day we wake up, we say, okay, if I make eight, if I make eight thousand dollars a month, that's eight hundred dollars. You divide that among every week. I can't do this math. What is that, $200 a week? Two times four is eight. Yeah, 200 bucks a week. You divide it per the day. I need to wake up and give God this much money every day, and that will remind me that he's in charge of today. I've never thought about that before. But what would it look like for me? I mean, I can give it all up front, and that's great, but if I need the reminder every day that God's got this day, God has this, he's on this, I need to do that every day then. Demonstrate, I trust you. This is my tenth. This is my tithe. I'm going to demonstrate I trust you in this. In all that you have, tithing is an act of faith that keeps our priorities straight. It keeps our focus on him. 
And that's a part of doing it every day, you know. I've never encouraged anyone to do that, but if that helps me stay focused on God and my pro- priorities on God, that's fantastic. It reminds us that we don't own anything, that he owns everything, right? He owns everything. And so uh, tithing recognizes that God uh, is our provider and that we prosper not just with resources, but with everything. We actually are healthier people and it, when it has nothing to do with money and everything to do with our relationship with God. We as believers, Christians believe that we don't give to God to get, though oftentimes he blesses in that. We don't give to get at all. Um, yeah, not at all. But he does bless. And sometimes it comes in resources, sometimes it doesn't. But when it's about God and not about receiving, it's a blessing. It really is a blessing to give. Seek first the kingdom of God. Show and share the love of Jesus. Go show and share the gospel. Go show the kingdom of God and talk about the kingdom of God. If we truly care about people, we would talk to them about Jesus. Not trying to convince them that I need to convert you. This has nothing to do with that because that's not our role. Our role is introducing them to good news. We don't, have a lift a, we don't have to live a life anymore that's in bondage to fearing what people think about us, living in fear of, of what, where my next uh, meal is going to come from. We don't have to live in that anymore because we have trust in Jesus. If we care, we would share. Hey, that's a core thing. If we care, we would share. Right, Corey? <laughs> sharing is caring. I've heard you say that. Sharing is caring. That's good. So here's a specific step I would encourage all of us to take, no matter where we're at in our journey with Jesus. No matter where we are with Jesus, I would encourage us to take this action step financially. I would encourage people to prayerfully give to where they would call their home church, where they are connected. Prayerfully give. That could be $5. That could be a dollar. This is not about an amount. This is about a heart. Just prayerfully say, I'm going to proactively give this much to God to demonstrate I have trust in him. My my children do that. My three kids do that. They say, God, I'm, or Dad, I'm going to trust God in this. I'm going to give them this. They have an envelope, and they wrote on it, Jesus. This is for Jesus. And they don't ever go without need. As a child, they're never starving, even though my youngest says he's always starving. <laughs> Honey, that's your, your third bowl of mac and cheese. You're not starving. Trust me, you're not starving. God provides. Like a child who never worries, we can still live as a child in the kingdom of God who never has to worry. So here's the action step. If you're, you're new and never really wrapped your mind ab- around giving and, and, and knew that there was a tie and the purpose of tithing has nothing to do with the church needing money, but it has everything to do with what I need in my heart and breaking free from the bondage in my life, I encourage you to pray about giving a consistent, purposeful amount. If you're already doing that, maybe you're here listening or here today, and this doesn't have to be with Living Roots. Like, hey, I trust God to take care of living roots. I do. Whatever that looks like, I, I, I don't care. I care more about people growing, breaking free the chains of finances than, than living roots being self-supported or anything like that. I want freedom for people. And so if you're already faithfully giving, you know what? I faithfully give $100 a month or $200 a month. I encourage you to be say, okay, what does it look like to give a percent of my income? 5% or 10%. And if someone is here today and they're already giving a tenth, it's like, I regularly give a tenth, and that really doesn't shake my faith. I just kind of do that, and that's, that's an automatic thing. What does it look like to, to make an offering above that? You know, there is a burnt building next door. There could be kids in Africa you can support, whatever that looks like. How can I live relying on Jesus? I told my wife when we we're early on in marriage, I said, you know what? A tithe is at the bottom, okay? I just want you to know I would love to live on 50% of my income. I'd love to give away the rest. It'd be so fun to just give away the rest. And so 
a tithe goes, and then the next is an offering, and then the next is living what we call this account of generosity. It's like, okay, now we get to say, okay, who can we bless with car, tires on their car? Who can we bless with this? Who can, and that is so fun. That is such a fun way to live. And so how can we move beyond just giving a tithe to continue to rest and trust the Lord? Maybe you're already doing that. Maybe you're already writing a check for tithe and you, you love what God is doing. Maybe you're already writing offerings and that's happening. Then I would encourage you to evaluate how it, are you demonstrating that God is priority in your life with your time? How are you spending time if, if we looked from the outside in at how you spend your time, what do you think about all day? How do you spend your time all day? What is it wrapped around? Is it God? Is it the things of God? Or is it about ourselves? And so uh, your action step this week would be God thanking God. And all of this is pressing into the Holy Spirit, asking God, okay, where do you want me to move in this? And if you're already giving living generous lives, praise be to God Thank you, Jesus. And then I just ask that you would evaluate how you spend your time, how you spend your thoughts in that. So I want to leave you guys with this as we seek first the kingdom of God. Because uh, unfortunately, like I said earlier, all this is tied to resources. All, all, all these resources are tied to the kingdom of God as, G as Jesus shares here. Wherever your treasure is, there your desires of your heart will also be I want to leave you guys with this. God loves you. Pay attention to everything I'm about to say. God loves you when you give. And God loves you when you don't give. You need to know that. God's love is not based off of you giving at all. When you were enemies of God, when you spit upon him, when you didn't care about him, when you didn't know him, he loved you dearly. He sent his son to demonstrate that love for us. We cannot give a dollar in our whole lives. His love does not change. But as Jesus said, unfortunately, our love does. His love is unconditional. Unfortunately, ours is conditional. And it's often tied to our resources. So I just want to encourage you guys in the gospel that Jesus loves regardless of where you are with your giving, your finances, your resources. He just doesn't want you in bondage. Amen. Pray with me. Father God, we, we thank you and bless you. We are so, so indebted to your, your love for us. We ask, God, that you would continue, by your grace, set us free from bondage, whether it's connected to finances, resources, possessions, whatever that might be. I pray you set us free. And on top of that, God, I ask that you would allow us to experience the Holy Spirit move in the everyday life. Allow us to experience testimonies that demonstrate that you're alive and well, that you have given us power and authority to cast out all demons, to, to heal the sick, to, to, to do all those things you say you've given us power to do through the Holy Spirit. And so we want to grow in our trust in you, reliance on you, relying on you for everything in life. I pray for each and every person connected to living roots, I pray for each and every person connected to any congregation that elevates the name of Jesus that you would have grace on them and allow them to grow in their relationship with you, grow in their trust in you. Be glorified in us, through us. Be glorified in our homes in how we love one another. Be glorified in our GCM groups, our gospel communities that live on mission. Be glorified in our church families. Be glorified in our biological families. We give you our biological families. Be glorified in our city. Be glorified in our county. We want to experience more and more the kingdom of God. I want your authority to be demonstrated, Jesus, more and more in my life and over this city and town and county. We invite you to have your way, Jesus. I pray 
that more and more people hear the good news that's connected to you, that points to you, Jesus. I pray you set people free and that people can see it, that you are truly good, right, and perfect. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us online. Bless you. Have an awesome day. If I see you this week, fantastic. Praise God. I'll see you next time. Amen.